In our last journey through the mesmerizing world of Pride and Prejudice, we watched as Elizabeth Bennet danced delicately with the enigmatic Mr. Darcy. Today, as we delve into chapters 9 through 16, we'll find our heroine and her family navigating an intricate web of societal expectations, misunderstandings, and blooming emotions. But as tensions rise and the plot thickens, can Elizabeth see past the pride and prejudice that surround her? And what of Mr. Darcy? Is he the man Elizabeth believes him to be? Before we venture on, if you're enchanted by Jane Austen's vivid portrayal of Regency-era romance, don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. At Obsidian River Productions, we're on a quest to bring timeless tales to life, and we'd love for you to join our community. Now, prepare to be whisked away to the world of ballrooms, letters, and silent glances as the story continues to unfold. Chapter 9 Elizabeth passed the chief of the night in her sister's room, and in the morning had the pleasure of being able to send a tolerable answer to the inquiries which she very early received from Mr. Bingley by a housemaid, and some time afterwards from the two elegant ladies who waited on his sisters. In spite of this amendment, however, she requested to have a note sent to Longbourn, desiring her mother to visit Jane and form her own judgment of her situation. The note was immediately dispatched, and its contents as quickly complied with. Mrs. Bennet, accompanied by her two youngest girls, reached Netherfield soon after the family breakfast. Had she found Jane in any apparent danger, Mrs. Bennet would have been very miserable. But being satisfied on seeing her that her illness was not alarming, she had no wish of her recovering immediately, as her restoration to health would probably remove her from Netherfield. She would not listen, therefore, to her daughter's proposal of being carried home. Neither did the apothecary, who arrived about the same time, think it at all advisable. After sitting a little while with Jane, on Miss Bingley's appearance and invitation, the mother and three daughters all attended her into the breakfast parlour. Bingley met them with hopes that Mrs. Bennet had not found Miss Bennet worse than she expected. "'Indeed I have, sir,' was her answer. "'She's a great deal too ill to be moved.' Mr. Jones says we must not think of moving her. We must trespass a little longer on your kindness. Removed, cried Bingley. It must not be thought of. My sister, I am sure, will not hear of her removal. You may depend upon it, madam, said Miss Bingley, with cold civility, that Miss Bennet shall receive every possible attention while she remains with us. Mrs. Bennet was profuse in her acknowledgments. I am sure, she added, if it was not for such good friends, I do not know what would become of her, for she is very ill indeed, and suffers a vast deal, though with the greatest patience in the world, which is always the way with her, for she has, without exception, the sweetest temper I ever met with. I often tell my other girls they are nothing to her. You have a sweet room here, Mr. Bingley, and a charming prospect over that gravel walk. I do not know a place in the country that is equal to Netherfield. You will not think of quitting it in a hurry, I hope, though you have but a short lease. Whatever I do is done in a hurry, replied he, and therefore if I should resolve to quit Netherfield, I should probably be off in five minutes. At present, however, I consider myself as quite fixed here. That is exactly what I should have supposed of you, said Elizabeth. You begin to comprehend me, do you? cried he, turning towards her. Oh yes, I understand you perfectly. I wish I might take this for a compliment, but to be so easily seen through, I am afraid, is pitiful. That is, as it happens, it does not necessarily follow that a deep, intricate character is more or less estimable than such a one as yours. Lizzie, cried her mother, remember where you are, and do not run on in the wild manner that you are suffered to do at home. I did not know before, continued Bingley immediately, that you were a studier of character, it must be an amusing study. Yes, but intricate characters are the most amusing. They have at least that advantage. The country, said Darcy, can in general supply but few subjects for such a study. In a country neighbourhood you move in a very confined and unvarying society. But people themselves alter so much that there is something new to be observed in them forever. 
"'Yes, indeed,' cried Mrs. Bennet, "'offended by his manner of mentioning a country neighbourhood. "'I assure you there is quite as much of that going on in the country as in town.' "'Everybody was surprised, "'and Darcy, after looking at her for a moment, turned silently away. "'Mrs. Bennet, who fancied she had gained a complete victory over him, "'continued her triumph. "'I cannot see that London has any great advantage over the country for my part, "'except the shops and public places.' The country is a vast deal pleasanter, is not it, Mr. Bingley? When I am in the country, he replied, I never wish to leave it, and when I am in town, it is pretty much the same. They have each their advantages, and I can be equally happy in either. Aye, that is because you have the right disposition. But that gentleman, looking at Darcy, seemed to think the country was nothing at all. Indeed, Mamma, you are mistaken, said Elizabeth, blushing for her mother. "'You quite mistook Mr. Darcy. "'He only meant that there was not such a variety of people "'to be met with in the country as in town, "'which you must acknowledge to be true. "'Certainly, my dear, nobody said there were. "'But as to not meeting with many people in this neighbourhood, "'I believe there are few neighbourhoods larger. "'I know we dine with four-and-twenty families.' "'Nothing but concern for Elizabeth "'could enable Bingley to keep his countenance. "'His sister was less delicate,' and directed her eye towards Mr. Darcy with a very expressive smile. Elizabeth, for the sake of saying something that might turn her mother's thoughts, now asked her if Charlotte Lucas had been at Longbourn since her coming away. Yes, she called yesterday with her father. What an agreeable man Sir William is, Mr. Bingley, is not he? So much the man of fashion, so genteel and so easy. He has always something to say to everybody. That is my idea of good breeding and those persons who fancy themselves very important and never open their mouths quite mistake the matter. Did Charlotte dine with you? No, she would go home. I fancy she was wanted about the mince pies. For my part, Mr. Bingley, I always keep servants that can do their own work. My daughters are brought up differently, but everybody is to judge for themselves, and the Lucases are a very good sort of girls, I assure you. It is a pity they are not handsome. Not that I think Charlotte so very plain, but then she is our particular friend. She seems a very pleasant young woman, said Bingley. Oh dear, yes, but you must own she is very plain. Lady Lucas herself has often said so, and envied me Jane's beauty. I do not like to boast of my own child, but to be sure, Jane, one does not often see anybody better looking. It is what everybody says. I do not trust my own partiality. When she was only fifteen... There was a gentleman at my brother Gardiner's in town so much in love with her that my sister-in-law was sure he would make her an offer before we came away, but however he did not. Perhaps he thought her too young. However, he wrote some verses on her, and very pretty they were. And so ended his affection, said Elizabeth impatiently. There has been many a one, I fancy, overcome in the same way. I wonder who first discovered the efficacy of poetry in driving away love. I have been used to consider poetry as the food of love, said Darcy. Of a fine, stout, healthy love it may. Everything nourishes what is strong already, but if it be only a slight, thin sort of inclination, I am convinced that one good sonnet will starve it entirely away. Darcy only smiled, and the general pause which ensued made Elizabeth tremble, lest her mother should be exposing herself again. She longed to speak, but could think of nothing to say. And after a short silence, Mrs., Bennet began repeating her thanks to Mr. Bingley for his kindness to Jane, with an apology for troubling him also with Lizzie. Mr. Bingley was unaffectedly civil in his answer, and forced his younger sister to be civil also, and say what the occasion required. She performed her part, indeed, without much graciousness, but Mrs. Bennet was satisfied, and soon afterwards, ordered her carriage. Upon this signal, the youngest of her daughters put herself forward. The two girls had been whispering to each other during the whole visit, and the result of it was that the youngest should tax Mr. Bingley with having promised on his first coming into the country to give a ball at Netherfield. Lydia was a stout, well-grown girl of fifteen, with a fine complexion and good-humoured countenance. A favourite with her mother, whose affection had brought her into public at an early age. She had high animal spirits and a sort of natural self-consequence, 
which the attentions of the officers, to whom her uncle's good dinners and her own easy manners recommended her, had increased into assurance. She was very equal, therefore, to address Mr. Bingley on the subject of the ball, and abruptly reminded him of his promise, adding that it would be the most shameful thing in the world if he did not keep it. His answer to this sudden attack was delightful to her mother's ear. I am perfectly ready, I assure you, to keep my engagement, and, when your sister is recovered, you shall, if you please, name the very day of the ball. But you would not wish to be dancing while she is ill. Lydia declared herself satisfied. Oh, yes, it would be much better to wait till Jane was well, and by that time, most likely, Captain Carter would be at Meryton again. And when you have given your ball, she added, I shall insist on their giving one also. I shall tell Colonel Forster it will be quite a shame if he does not. Mrs. Bennet and her daughters then departed, and Elizabeth returned instantly to Jane, leaving her own and her relations' behaviour to the remarks of the two ladies and Mr. Darcy, the latter of whom, however, could not be prevailed on to join in their censure of her, in spite of all Miss Bingley's witticisms on fine eyes. Chapter 10 The day passed much as the day before had done. Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley had spent some hours of the morning with the invalid, who continued, though slowly, to mend, and, in the evening, Elizabeth joined their party in the drawing-room. The loo table, however, did not appear. Mr. Darcy was writing, and Miss Bingley, seated near him, was watching the progress of his letter, and repeatedly calling off his attention by messages to his sister. Mr. Hurst and Mr. Bingley were at P.K., and Mrs. Hurst was observing their game. Elizabeth took up some needlework, and was sufficiently amused in attending to what passed between Darcy and his companion. The perpetual commendations of the lady, either on his handwriting, or on the evenness of his lines, or on the length of his letter, with the perfect unconcern with which her praises were received, formed a curious dialogue, and was exactly in unison with her opinion of each. How delighted Miss Darcy will be to receive such a letter! He made no answer. You write uncommonly fast. You are mistaken. I write rather slowly. How many letters you must have occasion to write in the course of a year. Letters of business, too. How odious I should think them. It is fortunate, then, that they fall to my lot instead of to yours. Pray tell your sister that I long to see her. I have already told her so once by your desire. I'm afraid you do not like your pen. Let me mend it for you. I mend pens remarkably well. Thank you, but I always mend my own. How can you contrive to write so even? He was silent. Tell your sister I am delighted to hear of her improvement on the harp, and pray let her know that I am quite in raptures with her beautiful little design for a table, and I think it infinitely superior to Miss Grantley's. Will you give me leave to defer your raptures till I write again? At present I have not room to do them justice. Oh, it is of no consequence. I shall see her in January. But do you always write such charming long letters to her, Mr. Darcy? They are generally long, but whether always charming, it is not for me to determine. It is a rule with me that a person who can write a long letter with ease cannot write ill. That will not do for a compliment to Darcy, Caroline, cried her brother, because he does not write with ease. He studies too much for words of four syllables. Do not you, Darcy? My style of writing is very different from yours. Oh, cried Miss Bingley, Charles writes in the most careless way imaginable. He leaves out half his words and blots the rest. My ideas flow so rapidly that I have not time to express them, by which means my letters sometimes convey no ideas at all to my correspondents. Your humility, Mr. Bingley, said Elizabeth, must disarm reproof. Nothing is more deceitful, said Darcy, than the appearance of humility. It is often only carelessness of opinion, and sometimes an indirect boast. And which of the two do you call my little recent piece of modesty? The indirect boast, for you are really proud of your defects in writing, because you consider them as proceeding from a rapidity of thought and carelessness of execution, which, if not estimable, you think at least highly interesting. The power of doing anything with quickness is always much prized by the possessor, and often, without any attention, 
to the imperfection of the performance. When you told Mrs. Bennet this morning that if you ever resolved on quitting Netherfield, you should be gone in five minutes, you meant it to be a sort of panegyric, of compliment to yourself. And yet what is there so very laudable in a precipitance which must leave very necessary business undone and can be of no real advantage to yourself or anyone else? Nay, cried Bingley, this is too much to remember at night all the foolish things that were said in the morning. And yet, upon my honour, I believed what I said of myself to be true, and I believe it at this moment. At least, therefore, I did not assume the character of needless precipitance merely to show off before the ladies. I dare say you believed it, but I am by no means convinced that you would be gone with such celerity. Your conduct would be quite as dependent on chance as that of any man I know, and if, as you were mounting your horse, a friend were to say, Bingley, you had better stay till next week, you would probably do it, you would probably not go, and, at another word, might stay a month. You have only proved by this, cried Elizabeth, that Mr. Bingley did not do justice to his own disposition. You have shown him off now much more than he did himself. I am exceedingly gratified, said Bingley, by your converting what my friend says into a compliment on the sweetness of my temper. But I am afraid you are giving it a turn, which that gentleman did by no means intend, for he would certainly think the better of me if, under such a circumstance, I were to give a flat denial and ride off as fast as I could. Would Mr. Darcy then consider the rashness of your original intention as atoned for by your obstinacy in adhering to it? Upon my word, I cannot exactly explain the matter. Darcy must speak for himself. You expect me to account for opinions which you choose to call mine, but which I have never acknowledged. Allowing the case, however, to stand according to your representation, you must remember, Miss Bennet, that the friend who is supposed to desire his return to the house and the delay of his plan has merely desired it, asked it without offering one argument in favour of its propriety. To yield readily, easily, to the persuasion of a friend is no merit with you. To yield without conviction is no compliment to the understanding of either. You appear to me, Mr. Darcy, to allow nothing for the influence of friendship and affection. A regard for the requester would often make one readily yield to a request, without waiting for arguments to reason one into it. I am not particularly speaking of such a case as you have supposed about Mr. Bingley. We may as well wait, perhaps, till the circumstance occurs, before we discuss the discretion of his behaviour thereupon. But in general and ordinary cases, between friend and friend, where one of them is desired by the other to change a resolution of no very great moment, should you think ill of that person for complying with the desire, without waiting to be argued into it? Will it not be advisable, before we proceed on this subject, to arrange with rather more precision the degree of importance which is to appertain to this request, as well as the degree of intimacy subsisting between the parties? By all means, cried Bingley, let us hear all the particulars, not forgetting their comparative height and size, for that will have more weight in the argument, Miss Bennet, than you may be aware of. I assure you that if Darcy were not such a great tall fellow, in comparison with myself I should not pay him half so much deference. I declare I do not know a more awful object than Darcy on particular occasions, and in particular places, at his own house especially, and of a Sunday evening, when he has nothing to do. Mr. Darcy smiled, but Elizabeth thought she could perceive that he was rather offended, and therefore checked her laugh. Miss Bingley warmly resented the indignity he had received in an expostulation with her brother for talking such nonsense. I see your design, Bingley, said his friend. You dislike an argument and want to silence this. Perhaps I do. Arguments are too much like disputes. If you and Miss Bennet will defer yours till I am out of the room, I shall be very thankful. And then you may say whatever you like of me. What you ask, said Elizabeth, is no sacrifice on my side, and Mr. Darcy had much better finish his letter. Mr. Darcy took her advice and did finish his letter. When that business was over, he applied to Miss Bingley and Elizabeth for the indulgence of some music. Miss Bingley moved with alacrity to the pianoforte 
and after a polite request that Elizabeth would lead the way, which the other as politely and more earnestly negatived, she seated herself. Mrs. Hurst sang with her sister, and while they were thus employed, Elizabeth could not help observing, as she turned over some music books that lay on the instrument, how frequently Mr. Darcy's eyes were fixed on her. She hardly knew how to suppose that she could be an object of admiration to so great a man, and yet that he should look at her because he disliked her was still more strange. She could only imagine, however, at last, that she drew his notice, because there was something about her more wrong and reprehensible, according to his ideas of right, than in any other person present. The supposition did not pain her. She liked him too little to care for his approbation. After playing some Italian songs, Miss Bingley varied the charm by a lively Scotch air. And soon afterwards, Mr. Darcy, drawing near Elizabeth, said to her, Do you not feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to see such an opportunity of dancing a reel? She smiled, but made no answer. He repeated the question, with some surprise at her silence. Oh, said she, I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say, yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste, but I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes and cheating a person of their premeditated contempt. I have, therefore, made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all, and now despise me if you dare. Indeed, I do not dare. Elizabeth, having rather expected to affront him, was amazed at his gallantry, but there was a mixture of sweetness and archness in her manner, which made it difficult for her to affront anybody, and Darcy had never been so bewitched by any woman as he was by her. He really believed that, were it not for the inferiority of her connections, he should be in some danger. Miss Bingley saw, or suspected, enough to be jealous, and her great anxiety for the recovery of her dear friend Jane received some assistance from her desire of getting rid of Elizabeth. She often tried to provoke Darcy into disliking her guest by talking of their supposed marriage and planning his happiness in such an alliance. I hope, said she, as they were walking together in the shrubbery the next day, you will give your mother-in-law a few hints when this desirable event takes place as to the advantage of holding her tongue, and if you can compass it, to cure the younger girls of running after the officers, and, if I may mention so delicate a subject, endeavour to check that little something, bordering on conceit and impertinence, which your lady possesses. Have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity? Oh yes, do let the portraits of your uncle and Aunt Phillips be placed in the gallery at Pemberley. Put them next to your great-uncle the judge. They are in the same profession, you know, only in different lines. As for your Elizabeth's picture, you must not attempt to have it taken, for what painter could do justice to those beautiful eyes? It would not be easy, indeed, to catch their expression, but their colour and shape and the eyelashes, so remarkably fine, might be copied. At that moment, they were met from another walk by Mrs. Hurst and Elizabeth herself. I did not know that you intended to walk, said Miss Bingley, in some confusion, lest they had been overheard. You used us abominably ill, answered Mrs. Hurst, running away without telling us that you were coming out. Then, taking the disengaged arm of Mr. Darcy, she left Elizabeth to walk by herself. The path just admitted three. Mr. Darcy felt their rudeness, and immediately said, This walk is not wide enough for our party. We had better go into the avenue. But Elizabeth, who had not the least inclination to remain with them, laughingly answered, No, no, stay where you are. You are charmingly grouped and appear to uncommon advantage. The picturesque would be spoilt by admitting a fourth. Goodbye. She then ran gaily off, rejoicing as she rambled about, in the hope of being at home again in a day or two. Jane was already so much recovered as to intend leaving her room for a couple of hours that evening. Chapter 11 When the ladies removed after dinner, Elizabeth ran up to her sister, and seeing her well guarded from cold, attended her into the drawing room, where she was welcomed by her two friends with many professions of pleasure, and Elizabeth had never seen them so agreeable as they were during the hour which passed before the gentlemen appeared. 
their powers of conversation were considerable. They could describe an entertainment with accuracy, relate an anecdote with humour, and laugh at their acquaintance with spirit. But when the gentlemen entered, Jane was no longer the first object. Miss Bingley's eyes were instantly turned towards Darcy, and she had something to say to him before he had advanced many steps. He addressed himself directly to Miss Bennet with a polite congratulation. Mr. Hurst also made her a slight bow and said he was very glad, but diffuseness and warmth remained for Bingley's salutation. He was full of joy and attention. The first half hour was spent in piling up the fire, lest she should suffer from the change of room, and she removed, at his desire, to the other side of the fireplace, that she might be farther from the door. He then sat down by her and talked scarcely to anyone else. Elizabeth, at work in the opposite corner, saw it all with great delight. When tea was over, Mr. Hurst reminded his sister-in-law of the card table, but in vain. She had obtained private intelligence that Mr. Darcy did not wish for cards, and Mr. Hurst soon found even his open petition rejected. She assured him that no one intended to play, and the silence of the whole party on the subject seemed to justify her. Mr. Hurst had, therefore, nothing to do but to stretch himself on one of the sofas and go to sleep. Darcy took up a book. Miss Bingley did the same, and Mrs. Hurst, principally occupied in playing with her bracelets and rings, joined now and then in her brother's conversation with Miss Bennet. Miss Bingley's attention was quite as much engaged in watching Mr. Darcy's progress through his book as in reading her own, and she was perpetually either making some inquiry or looking at his page. She could not win him, however, to any conversation. He merely answered her question and read on. At length, quite exhausted by the attempt to be amused with her own book, which she had only chosen because it was the second volume of his, she gave a great yawn and said, how pleasant it is to spend an evening in this way. I declare, after all, there is no enjoyment like reading. How much sooner one tires of anything than of a book. When I have a house of my own, I shall be miserable if I have not an excellent library. No one made any reply. She then yawned again, threw aside her book, and cast her eyes round the room in quest of some amusement. When, hearing her brother mentioning a ball to Miss Bennet, she turned suddenly towards him and said, By the by, Charles, are you really serious in meditating a dance at Netherfield? I would advise you, before you determine on it, to consult the wishes of the present party. I am much mistaken if there are not some among us to whom a ball would be rather a punishment than a pleasure. If you mean Darcy, cried her brother, he may go to bed, if he chooses, before it begins, but as for the ball, it is quite a settled thing, and as soon as Nichols has made white soup enough, I shall send round my cards. I should like balls infinitely better, she replied, if they were carried on in a different manner, but there is something insufferably tedious in the usual process of such a meeting. It would surely be much more rational if conversation instead of dancing made the order of the day. Much more rational, my dear Caroline, I dare say, but it would not be near so much like a ball. Miss Bingley made no answer, and soon afterwards got up and walked about the room. Her figure was elegant and she walked well, but Darcy, at whom it was all aimed, was still inflexibly studious. In the desperation of her feelings, she resolved on one effort more, and turning to Elizabeth said, Miss Eliza Bennet, let me persuade you to follow my example and take a turn about the room. I assure you it is very refreshing after sitting so long in one attitude. Elizabeth was surprised, but agreed to it immediately. Miss Bingley succeeded no less in the real object of her civility. Mr. Darcy looked up. He was as much awake to the novelty of attention in that quarter as Elizabeth herself could be, and unconsciously closed his book. He was directly invited to join their party, but he declined it, observing that he could imagine but two motives for their choosing to walk up and down the room together with either of which motives his joining them would interfere. What could he mean? She was dying to know what could be his meaning, and asked Elizabeth whether she could at all understand him. Not at all, was her answer, but depend upon it, he means to be severe on us, and our surest way of disappointing him will be to ask nothing about it. 
Miss Bingley, however, was incapable of disappointing Mr. Darcy in anything and persevered, therefore, in requiring an explanation of his two motives. I have not the smallest objection to explaining them, said he, as soon as she allowed him to speak. You either choose this method of passing the evening because you are in each other's confidence and have secret affairs to discuss, or because you are conscious that your figures appear to the greatest advantage in walking. If the first, I should be completely in your way. And if the second, I can admire you much better as I sit by the fire. Oh, shocking, cried Miss Bingley. I never heard anything so abominable. How shall we punish him for such a speech? Nothing so easy if you have but the inclination, said Elizabeth. We can all plague and punish one another, tease him, laugh at him. Intimate as you are, you must know how it is to be done. But upon my honour I do not. I do assure you that my intimacy has not yet taught me that. Tease calmness of temper and presence of mind. No, no, I feel he may defy us there. And as to laughter, we will not expose ourselves, if you please, by attempting to laugh without a subject. Mr. Darcy may hug himself. Mr. Darcy is not to be laughed at, cried Elizabeth. That is an uncommon advantage, and uncommon I hope it will continue, for it would be a great loss to me to have many such acquaintance. I dearly love a laugh. Miss Bingley, said he, has given me credit for more than can be. The wisest and best of men, nay the wisest and best of their actions, may be rendered ridiculous by a person whose first object in life is a joke. Certainly, replied Elizabeth, there are such people, but I hope I am not one of them. I hope I never ridicule what is wise or good. Follies and nonsense, whims and inconsistencies, do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can. But these, I suppose, are precisely what you are without. Perhaps that is not possible for anyone. But it has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses, which often expose a strong understanding to ridicule such as vanity and pride. Yes, vanity is a weakness indeed. But pride, where there is a real superiority of mind, pride will be always under good regulation. Elizabeth turned away to hide a smile. Your examination of Mr. Darcy is over, I presume, said Miss Bingley. And pray, what is the result? I am perfectly convinced by it that Mr. Darcy has no defect. He owns it himself without disguise. No, said Darcy, I have made no such pretension. I have faults enough, but they are not, I hope, of understanding. My temper I dare not vouch for. It is, I believe, too little yielding, certainly too little for the convenience of the world. I cannot forget the follies and vices of others so soon as I ought, nor their offences against myself. My feelings are not puffed about with every attempt to move them. My temper would perhaps be called resentful, my good opinion once lost is lost for ever. That is a failing indeed, cried Elizabeth. Implacable resentment is a shade in a character. But you have chosen your fault well. I really cannot laugh at it. You are safe from me. There is, I believe, in every disposition a tendency to some particular evil, a natural defect, which not even the best education can overcome. And your defect is a propensity to hate everybody. And yours, he replied with a smile, is willfully to misunderstand them. Do let us have a little music, cried Miss Bingley, tired of a conversation in which she had no share. Louisa, you will not mind my waking Mr. Hurst. Her sister made not the smallest objection, and the pianoforte was opened, and Darcy, after a few moments' recollection, was not sorry for it. He began to feel the danger of paying Elizabeth too much attention. Chapter 12 In consequence of an agreement between the sisters, Elizabeth wrote the next morning to her mother to beg that the carriage might be sent for them in the course of the day. But Mrs. Bennet, who had calculated on her daughters remaining at Netherfield till the following Tuesday, which would exactly finish Jane's week, could not bring herself to receive them with pleasure before. Her answer, therefore, was not propitious, at least not to Elizabeth's wishes, for she was impatient to get home. Mrs. Bennet sent them word that they could not possibly have the carriage before Tuesday, and in her postscript it was added that if Mr. Bingley and his sister pressed them to stay longer, 
she could spare them very well. Against staying longer, however, Elizabeth was positively resolved, nor did she much expect it would be asked, and fearful, on the contrary, of being considered as intruding themselves needlessly long, she urged Jane to borrow Mr Bingley's carriage immediately, and at length it was settled that their original design of leaving Netherfield that morning should be mentioned, and the request made. The communication excited many professions of concern, and enough was said of wishing them to stay at least till the following day to work on Jane, until the morrow their going was deferred. Miss Bingley was then sorry that she had proposed the delay, for her jealousy and dislike of one sister much exceeded her affection for the other. The master of the house heard with real sorrow that they were to go so soon, and repeatedly tried to persuade Miss Bennet that it would not be safe for her, that she was not enough recovered, but Jane was firm where she felt herself to be right. To Mr Darcy it was welcome intelligence. Elizabeth had been at Netherfield long enough. She attracted him more than he liked, and Miss Bingley was uncivil to her and more teasing than usual to himself. He wisely resolved to be particularly careful that no sign of admiration should now escape him, nothing that could elevate her with the hope of influencing his felicity, sensible that, if such an idea had been suggested, his behaviour during the last day must have material weight in confirming or crushing it. Steady to his purpose, he scarcely spoke ten words to her through the whole of Saturday, and though they were at one time left by themselves for half an hour, he adhered most conscientiously to his book and would not even look at her. On Sunday, after morning service, the separation, so agreeable to almost all, took place. Miss Bingley's civility to Elizabeth increased at last very rapidly, as well as her affection for Jane, and when they parted, after assuring the latter of the pleasure, it would always give her to see her either at Longbourn or Netherfield, and embracing her most tenderly, she even shook hands with the former. Elizabeth took leave of the whole party in the liveliest spirits. They were not welcomed home very cordially by their mother. Mrs. Bennet wondered at their coming, and thought them very wrong to give so much trouble, and was sure Jane would have caught cold again. But their father, though very laconic in his expressions of pleasure, was really glad to see them. He had felt their importance in the family circle. The evening conversation, when they were all assembled, had lost much of its animation, and almost all its sense, by the absence of Jane and Elizabeth. They found Mary, as usual, deep in the study of thorough base and human nature, and had some new extracts to admire, and some new observations of threadbare morality to listen to. Catherine and Lydia had information for them of a different sort. Much had been done, and much had been said in the regiment since the preceding Wednesday. Several of the officers had dined lately with their uncle. A private had been flogged, and it had actually been hinted that Colonel Forster was going to be married. Chapter 13 I hope, my dear, said Mr. Bennet to his wife, as they were at breakfast the next morning, that you have ordered a good dinner today, because I have reason to expect an addition to our family party. Who do you mean, my dear? I know of nobody that is coming, I am sure, unless Charlotte Lucas should happen to call in, and I hope my dinners are good enough for her. I do not believe she often sees such at home. The person of whom I speak is a gentleman and a stranger. Mrs. Bennet's eyes sparkled. A gentleman and a stranger. It is Mr. Bingley, I am sure. Why, Jane, you never dropped a word of this, you sly thing. Well, I am sure I shall be extremely glad to see Mr. Bingley. But, good Lord, how unlucky. There is not a bit of fish to be got today. Lydia, my love, ring the bell. I must speak to Hill this moment. It is not Mr. Bingley, said her husband. It is a person whom I never saw in the whole course of my life. This roused a general astonishment and he had the pleasure of being eagerly questioned by his wife and five daughters at once. After amusing himself some time with their curiosity, he thus explained, About a month ago I received this letter, and about a fortnight ago I answered it, for I thought it a case of some delicacy and requiring early attention. It is from my cousin, Mr. Collins, who, when I am dead, may turn you all out of this house as soon as he pleases. 
Oh, my dear, cried his wife, I cannot bear to hear that mentioned. Pray do not talk of that odious man. I do think it is the hardest thing in the world that your estate should be entailed away from your own children, and I am sure, if I had been you, I should have tried long ago to do something or other about it. Jane and Elizabeth attempted to explain to her the nature of an entail. They had often attempted it before, but it was a subject on which Mrs. Bennet was beyond the reach of reason, and she continued to rail bitterly against the cruelty of settling an estate away from a family of five daughters, in favour of a man whom nobody cared anything about. "'It certainly is a most iniquitous affair,' said Mr. Bennet, "'and nothing can clear Mr. Collins from the guilt of inheriting Longbourn. "'But if you will listen to his letter, "'you may perhaps be a little softened by his manner of expressing himself. "'No, that I am sure I shall not, "'and I think it was very impertinent of him to write to you at all, "'and very hypocritical. "'I hate such false friends. "'Why could not he keep on quarrelling with you, as his father did before him?' Why, indeed, he does seem to have had some filial scruples on that head, as you will hear. Hunsford, near Westerham, Kent, the 15th of October. Dear Sir, the disagreement subsisting between yourself and my late honoured father always gave me much uneasiness, and, since I have had the misfortune to lose him, I have frequently wished to heal the breach. But for some time I was kept back by my own doubts, fearing lest it might seem disrespectful to his memory for me to be on good terms with anyone with whom it had always pleased him to be at variance. There, Mrs. Bennet. My mind, however, is now made up on the subject. For, having received ordination at Easter, I have been so fortunate as to be distinguished by the patronage of the Right Honourable Lady, Catherine de Boer, widow of Sir Louis de Boer, whose bounty and beneficence has preferred me to the valuable rectory of this parish, where it shall be my earnest endeavour to demean myself with grateful respect towards her ladyship, and be ever ready to perform those rites and ceremonies which are instituted by the Church of England. As a clergyman, moreover, I feel it my duty to promote and establish the blessing of peace in all families within the reach of my influence, and on these grounds I flatter myself that my present overtures of goodwill are highly commendable, and that the circumstance of my being next in the entail of Longbourn Estate will be kindly overlooked on your side, and not lead you to reject the offered olive branch. I cannot be otherwise than concerned at being the means of injuring your amiable daughters, and beg leave to apologise for it, as well as to assure you of my readiness to make them every possible amends. But of this hereafter... If you should have no objection to receive me into your house, I propose myself the satisfaction of waiting on you and your family, Monday, November 18th, by four o'clock, and shall probably trespass on your hospitality till the Saturday sir night following, which I can do without any inconvenience, as Lady Catherine is far from objecting to my occasional absence on a Sunday, provided that some other clergyman is engaged to do the duty of the day." I remain, dear sir, with respectful compliments to your lady and daughters, your well-wisher and friend, William Collins. At four o'clock, therefore, we may expect this peacemaking gentleman, said Mr. Bennet, as he folded up the letter. He seems to be a most conscientious and polite young man upon my word, and, I doubt not, will prove a valuable acquaintance, especially if Lady Catherine should be so indulgent as to let him come to us again. There is some sense in what he says about the girls, however, and, if he is disposed to make them any amends, I shall not be the person to discourage him. Though it is difficult, said Jane, to guess in what way he can mean to make us the atonement he thinks our due, the wish is certainly to his credit. Elizabeth was chiefly struck with his extraordinary deference for Lady Catherine, and his kind intention of christening, marrying, and burying his parishioners whenever it were required. He must be an oddity, I think, said she. I cannot make him out. There is something very pompous in his style. And what can he mean by apologising for being next in the entail? We cannot suppose he would help it if he could. Can he be a sensible man, sir? No, my dear, I think not. I have great hopes of finding him quite the reverse. There is a mixture of civility and self-importance in his letter, which promises well. I am impatient to see him. In point of composition, said Mary, his letter does not seem defective, 
The idea of the olive branch, perhaps, is not wholly new, yet I think it is well expressed. To Catherine and Lydia, neither the letter nor its writer were in any degree interesting. It was next to impossible that their cousin should come in a scarlet coat, and it was now some weeks since they had received pleasure from the society of a man in any other colour. As for their mother, Mr. Collins's letter had done away much of her ill will, and she was preparing to see him with a degree of composure which astonished her husband and daughters. Mr. Collins was punctual to his time, and was received with great politeness by the whole family. Mr. Bennet indeed said little, but the ladies were ready enough to talk, and Mr. Collins seemed neither in need of encouragement nor inclined to be silent himself. He was a tall, heavy-looking young man of five and twenty. His air was grave and stately, and his manners were very formal. He had not been long seated before he complimented Mrs. Bennet on having so fine a family of daughters, said he had heard much of their beauty, but that, in this instance, fame had fallen short of the truth, and added that he did not doubt her seeing them all in due time well disposed of in marriage. This gallantry was not much to the taste of some of his hearers, but Mrs. Bennet, who quarrelled with no compliments, answered most readily, "'You are very kind, sir, I am sure, and I wish with all my heart it may prove so, for else they will be destitute enough. Things are settled so oddly. You allude, perhaps, to the entail of this estate?' "'Ah, sir, I do indeed. It is a grievous affair to my poor girls, you must confess. Not that I mean to find fault with you, for such things, I know, are all chance in this world. There is no knowing how estates will go when once they come to be entailed. I am very sensible, madam, of the hardship to my fair cousins, and could say much on the subject, but that I am cautious of appearing forward and precipitate. But I can assure the young ladies that I come prepared to admire them. At present I will not say more, but perhaps, when we are better acquainted, he was interrupted by a summons to dinner, and the girls smiled on each other. They were not the only objects of Mr. Collins's admiration. The hall, the dining room, and all its furniture were examined and praised, and his commendation of everything would have touched Mrs. Bennet's heart, but for the mortifying supposition of his viewing it all as his own future property. The dinner, too, in its turn, was highly admired, and he begged to know to which of his fair cousins the excellence of its cookery was owing. But here he was set right by Mrs. Bennet, who assured him, with some asperity, that they were very well able to keep a good cook, and that her daughters had nothing to do in the kitchen. He begged pardon for having displeased her. In a softened tone, she declared herself not at all offended, but he continued to apologise for about a quarter of an hour. Chapter 14 during dinner, Mr. Bennet scarcely spoke at all, but when the servants were withdrawn, he thought it time to have some conversation with his guest, and therefore started a subject in which he expected him to shine, by observing that he seemed very fortunate in his patroness. Lady Catherine de Bourg's attention to his wishes, and consideration for his comfort, appeared very remarkable. Mr. Bennet could not have chosen better. Mr. Collins was eloquent in her praise. The subject elevated him to more than usual solemnity of manner, and with a most important aspect, he protested that he had never in his life witnessed such behaviour in a person of rank, such affability and condescension as he had himself experienced from Lady Catherine. She had been graciously pleased to approve of both the discourses which he had already had the honour of preaching before her. She had also asked him twice to dine at Rosings, and had sent for him only the Saturday before, to make up her pool of quadrille in the evening. Lady Catherine was reckoned proud by many people he knew, but he had never seen anything but affability in her. She had always spoken to him as she would to any other gentleman. She made not the smallest objection to his joining in the society of the neighbourhood, nor to his leaving his parish occasionally for a week or two to visit his relations. She had even condescended to advise him to marry as soon as he could, provided he chose with discretion, and had once paid him a visit in his humble parsonage, where she had perfectly approved all the alterations he had been making, and had even vouchsafed to suggest some herself, some shelves in the closets upstairs. "'That is all very proper and civil, I am sure,' said Mrs. Bennet, 
and I dare say she is a very agreeable woman. It is a pity that great ladies in general are not more like her. Does she live near you, sir? The garden in which stands my humble abode is separated only by a lane from Rosings Park, her ladyship's residence. I think you said she was a widow, sir. Has she any family? She has one only daughter, the heiress of Rosings, and a very extensive property. Ah, cried Mrs. Bennet, shaking her head, then she is better off than many girls. And what sort of young lady is she? Is she handsome? She is a most charming young lady, indeed. Lady Catherine herself says that, in point of true beauty, Mr. Boer is far superior to the handsomest of her sex, because there is that in her features which marks the young woman of distinguished birth. She is unfortunately of a sickly constitution, which has prevented her making that progress in many accomplishments which she could not otherwise have failed of, as I am informed by the lady who superintended her education, and who still resides with them, but she is perfectly amiable, and often condescends to drive by my humble abode in her little phaeton and ponies. Has she been presented? I do not remember her name among the ladies at court. Her indifferent state of health unhappily prevents her being in town, and by that means, as I told Lady Catherine myself one day, has deprived the British court of its brightest ornament. Her ladyship seemed pleased with the idea, and you may imagine that I am happy on every occasion to offer those little delicate compliments which are always acceptable to ladies. I have more than once observed to Lady Catherine that her charming daughter seemed born to be a duchess, and that the most elevated rank, instead of giving her consequence, would be adorned by her. These are the kind of little things which please her ladyship, and it is a sort of attention which I conceive myself peculiarly bound to pay. You judge very properly, said Mr. Bennet, and it is happy for you that you possess the talent of flattering with delicacy. May I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment, or are the result of previous study? They arise chiefly from what is passing at the time, and though I sometimes amuse myself with suggesting and arranging such little elegant compliments as may be adapted to ordinary occasions, I always wish to give them as unstudied an air as possible. Mr. Bennet's expectations were fully answered. His cousin was as absurd as he had hoped, and he listened to him with the keenest enjoyment, maintaining at the same time the most resolute composure of countenance, and, except in an occasional glance at Elizabeth, requiring no partner in his pleasure. Chapter 15 Mr. Collins was not a sensible man, and the deficiency of nature had been but little assisted by education or society, the greatest part of his life having been spent under the guidance of an illiterate and miserly father. And though he belonged to one of the universities, he had merely kept the necessary terms without forming at it any useful acquaintance. The subjection in which his father had brought him up had given him originally great humility of manner, but it was now a good deal counteracted by the self-conceit of a weak head, living in retirement, and the consequential feelings of early and unexpected prosperity. A fortunate chance had recommended him to Lady Catherine de Bourg when the living of Hunsford was vacant, and the respect which he felt for her high rank and his veneration for her as his patroness, mingling with a very good opinion of himself, of his authority as a clergyman, and his right as a rector, made him altogether a mixture of pride and obsequiousness, self-importance and humility. Having now a good house and a very sufficient income, he intended to marry, and in seeking a reconciliation with the Longbourn family he had a wife in view, as he meant to choose one of the daughters, if he found them as handsome and amiable as they were represented by common report. This was his plan of amends, of atonement, for inheriting their father's estate, and he thought it an excellent one, full of eligibility and suitableness, and excessively generous and disinterested on his own part. His plan did not vary on seeing them. Miss Bennet's lovely face confirmed his views, and established all his strictest notions of what was due to seniority, and for the first evening she was his settled choice. The next morning, however, made an alteration, for in a quarter of an hour's tete-a-tete -tete with Mrs. Bennet before breakfast, a conversation beginning with his parsonage house, and leading naturally to the avowal of his hopes, 
that a mistress for it might be found at Longbourn produced from her, amid very complacent smiles and general encouragement, a caution against the very Jane he had fixed on. As to her younger daughters, she could not take upon her to say, she could not positively answer, but she did not know of any prepossession. Her eldest daughter, she must just mention, she felt it incumbent on her to hint, was likely to be very soon engaged. Mr. Collins had only to change from Jane to Elizabeth, and it was soon done, done while Mrs. Bennet was stirring the fire. Elizabeth, equally next to Jane in birth and beauty, succeeded her, of course. Mrs. Bennet treasured up the hint, and trusted that she might soon have two daughters married, and the man whom she could not bear to speak of the day before was now high in her good graces. Lydia's intention of walking to Meryton was not forgotten. Every sister except Mary agreed to go with her, and Mr. Collins was to attend them, at the request of Mr. Bennet, who was most anxious to get rid of him, and have his library to himself. For thither Mr. Collins had followed him after breakfast, and there he would continue, nominally engaged with one of the largest folios in the collection, but really talking to Mr. Bennet, with little cessation, of his house and garden at Hunsford. Such doings discomposed Mr. Bennet exceedingly. In his library he had been always sure of leisure and tranquillity, and though prepared, as he told Elizabeth, to meet with folly and conceit in every other room in the house, he was used to be free from them there. His civility, therefore, was most prompt in inviting Mr. Collins to join his daughters in their walk, and Mr. Collins, being in fact much better fitted for a walker than a reader, was extremely well pleased to close his large book and go. In pompous nothings on his side, and civil assents on that of his cousins, their time passed till they entered Meryton. The attention of the younger ones was then no longer to be gained by him. Their eyes were immediately wandering up the street in quest of the officers, and nothing less than a very smart bonnet, indeed, or a really new muslin in a shop window, could recall them. But the attention of every lady was soon caught by a young man, whom they had never seen before, of most gentlemanlike appearance, walking with an officer on the other side of the way. The officer was the very Mr. Denny, concerning whose return from London Lydia came to inquire, and he bowed as they passed. All were struck with the stranger's air, all wondered who he could be, and Kitty and Lydia, determined if possible to find out, led the way across the street, under pretense of wanting something in an opposite shop, and fortunately had just gained the pavement when the two gentlemen, turning back, had reached the same spot. Mr. Denny addressed them directly and entreated permission to introduce his friend Mr. Wickham, who had returned with him the day before from town, and, he was happy to say, had accepted a commission in their corps. This was exactly as it should be, for the young man wanted only regimentals to make him completely charming. His appearance was greatly in his favour. He had all the best parts of beauty, a fine countenance, a good figure, and very pleasing address. The introduction was followed up on his side by a happy readiness of conversation, a readiness at the same time perfectly correct and unassuming, and the whole party were still standing and talking together very agreeably when the sound of horses drew their notice and Darcy and Bingley were seen riding down the street. On distinguishing the ladies of the group, the two gentlemen came directly towards them and began the usual civilities. Bingley was the principal spokesman, and Miss Bennet the principal object. He was then, he said, on his way to Longbourn on purpose to inquire after her. Mr. Darcy corroborated it with a bow, and was beginning to determine not to fix his eyes on Elizabeth when they were suddenly arrested by the sight of the stranger, and Elizabeth happening to see the countenance of both as they looked at each other was all astonishment at the effect of the meeting. Both changed colour, one looked white, the other red. Mr. Wickham, after a few moments, touched his hat, a salutation which Mr. Darcy just deigned to return. What could be the meaning of it? It was impossible to imagine. It was impossible not to long to know. In another minute, Mr. Bingley, but without seeming to have noticed what passed, took leave and rode on with his friend. Mr. Denny and Mr. Wickham walked with the young ladies to the door of Mr. Phillips's house, and then made their bows, in spite of Miss Lydia's pressing entreaties that they would come in, 
and even in spite of Mrs. Phillips's throwing up the parlour window and loudly seconding the invitation. Mrs. Phillips was always glad to see her nieces, and the two eldest, from their recent absence, were particularly welcome, and she was eagerly expressing her surprise at their sudden return home, which, as their own carriage had not fetched them, she should have known nothing about if she had not happened to see Mr. Jones's shop boy in the street, who had told her that they were not to send any more drafts to Netherfield because the Miss Bennets were come away, when her civility was claimed towards Mr. Collins by Jane's introduction of him. She received him with her very best politeness, which he returned with as much more, apologising for his intrusion without any previous acquaintance with her, which he could not help flattering himself, however, might be justified by his relationship to the young ladies who introduced him to her notice. Mrs. Phillips was quite awed by such an excess of good breeding, but her contemplation of one stranger was soon put an end to by exclamations and inquiries about the other, of whom, however, she could only tell her nieces what they already knew, that Mr. Denny had brought him from London, and that he was to have a lieutenant's commission in the Shear. She had been watching him the last hour, she said, as he walked up and down the street, and had Mr. Wickham appeared, Kitty and Lydia would certainly have continued the occupation. But unluckily no one passed the windows now, except a few of the officers, who, in comparison with the stranger, were become stupid, disagreeable fellows. Some of them were to dine with the Phillipses the next day, and their aunt promised to make her husband call on Mr. Wickham and give him an invitation also, if the family from Longbourn would come in the evening. This was agreed to, and Mrs. Phillips protested that they would have a nice, comfortable, noisy game of lottery tickets, and a little bit of hot supper afterwards. The prospect of such delights was very cheering, and they parted in mutual good spirits. Mr. Collins repeated his apologies in quitting the room, and was assured, with unwearying civility, that they were perfectly needless. As they walked home, Elizabeth related to Jane what she had seen pass between the two gentlemen, but though Jane would have defended either or both, had they appeared to be wrong, she could no more explain such behaviour than her sister. Mr. Collins, on his return, highly gratified Mrs. Bennet by admiring Mrs. Phillips's manners and politeness. He protested that, except Lady Catherine and her daughter, he had never seen a more elegant woman, for she had not only received him with the utmost civility, but had even pointedly included him in her invitation for the next evening, although utterly unknown to her before. Something, he supposed, might be attributed to his connection with them, but yet he had never met with so much attention in the whole course of his life. Chapter 16 as no objection was made to the young people's engagement with their aunt, and all Mr. Collins's scruples of leaving Mr. and Mrs. Bennet for a single evening during his visit were most steadily resisted, the coach conveyed him and his five cousins at a suitable hour to Meryton, and the girls had the pleasure of hearing, as they entered the drawing-room, that Mr. Wickham had accepted their uncle's invitation and was then in the house. When this information was given, and they had all taken their seats, Mr. Collins was at leisure to look around him and admire, and he was so much struck with the size and furniture of the apartment that he declared he might almost have supposed himself in the small summer breakfast parlour at Rosings, a comparison that did not at first convey much gratification, but when Mrs. Phillips understood from him what Rosings was and who was its proprietor, when she had listened to the description of only one of Lady Catherine's drawing-rooms and found that the chimney-piece alone had cost eight hundred pounds, she felt all the force of the compliment and would hardly have resented a comparison with the housekeeper's room. In describing to her all the grandeur of Lady Catherine and her mansion, with occasional digressions in praise of his own humble abode and the improvements it was receiving, he was happily employed until the gentlemen joined them and he found in Mrs. Phillips a very attentive listener, whose opinion of his consequence increased with what she heard, and who was resolving to retail it all among her neighbours as soon as she could. To the girls, who could not listen to their cousin, and who had nothing to do but to wish for an instrument, and examine their own indifferent imitations of china on the mantelpiece, the interval of waiting appeared very long. It was over at last, however. The gentleman did approach and when Mr. Wickham walked into the room, 
Elizabeth felt that she had neither been seeing him before nor thinking of him since, with the smallest degree of unreasonable admiration. The officers of the shire were in general a very creditable, gentlemanlike set, and the best of them were of the present party. But Mr. Wickham was as far beyond them all in person, countenance, air and walk, as they were superior to the broad-faced, stuffy Uncle Phillips, breathing port wine, who followed them into the room. Mr. Wickham was the happy man towards whom almost every female eye was turned, and Elizabeth was the happy woman by whom he finally seated himself. And the agreeable manner in which he immediately fell into conversation, though it was only on its being a wet night and on the probability of a rainy season, made her feel that the commonest, dullest, most threadbare topic might be rendered interesting by the skill of the speaker. With such rivals for the notice of the fair as Mr. Wickham and the officers, Mr. Collins seemed to sink into insignificance. To the young ladies, he certainly was nothing, but he had still at intervals a kind listener in Mrs. Phillips, and was, by her watchfulness, most abundantly supplied with coffee and muffin. When the card tables were placed, he had an opportunity of obliging her, in return, by sitting down to whist. I know little of the game at present, said he, but I shall be glad to improve myself, for in my situation of life... Mrs. Phillips was very thankful for his compliance, but could not wait for his reason. Mr. Wickham did not play at whist, and with ready delight was he received at the other table between Elizabeth and Lydia. At first there seemed danger of Lydia's engrossing him entirely, for she was a most determined talker, but being likewise extremely fond of lottery tickets, she soon grew too much interested in the game, too eager in making bets and exclaiming after prizes to have attention for anyone in particular. Allowing for the common demands of the game, Mr. Wickham was therefore at leisure to talk to Elizabeth, and she was very willing to hear him, though what she chiefly wished to hear, she could not hope to be told, the history of his acquaintance with Mr. Darcy. She dared not even mention that gentleman. Her curiosity, however, was unexpectedly relieved. Mr. Wickham began the subject himself. He inquired how far Netherfield was from Meryton, and, after receiving her answer, asked in a hesitating manner how long Mr. Darcy had been staying there. "'About a month,' said Elizabeth, and then, unwilling to let the subject drop, added, "'He is a man of very large property in Derbyshire, I understand.' "'Yes,' replied Wickham. "'His estate there is a noble one, a clear ten thousand per annum. "'You could not have met with a person more capable "'of giving you certain information on that head than myself, "'for I have been connected with his family, "'in a particular manner, from my infancy.' "'Elizabeth could not but look surprised. "'You may well be surprised, Miss Bennet, at such an assertion, "'after seeing, as you probably might, "'the very cold manner of our meeting yesterday.' "'Are you much acquainted with Mr. Darcy?' "'As much as I ever wish to be,' cried Elizabeth warmly. "'I have spent four days in the same house with him, "'and I think him very disagreeable.' "'I have no right to give my opinion,' said Wickham, "'as to his being agreeable or otherwise. "'I am not qualified to form one. "'I have known him too long and too well to be a fair judge. "'It is impossible for me to be impartial. "'But I believe your opinion of him would in general astonish,' and perhaps you would not express it quite so strongly anywhere else. Here you are in your own family. Upon my word, I say no more here than I might say in any house in the neighbourhood, except Netherfield. He is not at all liked in Hertfordshire. Everybody is disgusted with his pride. You will not find him more favourably spoken of by anyone. I cannot pretend to be sorry, said Wickham, after a short interruption that he or that any man should not be estimated beyond their deserts. But with him, I believe it does not often happen. The world is blinded by his fortune and consequence, or frightened by his high and imposing manners, and sees him only as he chooses to be seen. I should take him, even on my slight acquaintance, to be an ill-tempered man. Wickham only shook his head. I wonder, said he, at the next opportunity of speaking, whether he is likely to be in this country much longer. I do not at all know, but I heard nothing of his going away when I was at Netherfield. I hope your plans in favour of the sheer will not be affected by his being in the neighbourhood. 
Oh, no, it is not for me to be driven away by Mr. Darcy. If he wishes to avoid seeing me, he must go. We are not on friendly terms, and it always gives me pain to meet him. But I have no reason for avoiding him but what I might proclaim to all the world, a sense of very great ill-usage and most painful regrets at his being what he is. His father, Miss Bennet, the late Mr. Darcy, was one of the best men that ever breathed, and the truest friend I ever had. And I can never be in company with this Mr. Darcy without being grieved to the soul by a thousand tender recollections. His behaviour to myself has been scandalous, but I verily believe I could forgive him anything and everything rather than his disappointing the hopes and disgracing the memory of his father. Elizabeth found the interest of the subject increase and listened with all her heart, but the delicacy of it prevented further inquiry. Mr. Wickham began to speak on more general topics, Meryton, the neighbourhood, the society, appearing highly pleased with all that he had yet seen, and speaking of the latter, especially, with gentle but very intelligible gallantry. It was the prospect of constant society and good society, he added, which was my chief inducement to enter the shire. I know it to be a most respectable, agreeable call, and my friend Denny tempted me further by his account of their present quarters and the very great attentions and excellent acquaintance Meryton had procured them. Society, I own, is necessary to me. I have been a disappointed man, and my spirits will not bear solitude. I must have employment and society. A military life is not what I was intended for, but circumstances have now made it eligible. The church ought to have been my profession. I was brought up for the church, and I should at this time have been in possession of a most valuable living, had it pleased the gentleman we were speaking of just now. Indeed, Yes, the late Mr. Darcy bequeathed me the next presentation of the best living in his gift. He was my godfather and excessively attached to me. I cannot do justice to his kindness. He meant to provide for me amply and thought he had done it, but when the living fell, it was given elsewhere. Good heavens, cried Elizabeth, but how could that be? How could his will be disregarded? Why did not you seek legal redress? There was just such an informality in the terms of the bequest as to give me no hope from law. A man of honour could not have doubted the intention, but Mr. Darcy chose to doubt it, or to treat it as a merely conditional recommendation, and to assert that I had forfeited all claim to it by extravagance, imprudence, in short, anything or nothing. Certain it is that the living became vacant two years ago, exactly as I was of an age to hold it, and that it was given to another man, and no less certain is it that I cannot accuse myself of having really done anything to deserve to lose it. I have a warm, unguarded temper, and I may perhaps have sometimes spoken my opinion of him, and to him, too freely. I can recall nothing worse. But the fact is that we are very different sort of men, and that he hates me. This is quite shocking. He deserves to be publicly disgraced. Some time or other he will be but it shall not be by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never defy or expose him. Elizabeth honoured him for such feelings and thought him handsomer than ever as he expressed them. But what, said she, after a pause, can have been his motive? What can have induced him to behave so cruelly? A thorough, determined dislike of me, a dislike which I cannot but attribute in some measure to jealousy. Had the late Mr. Darcy liked me less, his son might have borne with me better. But his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated him, I believe, very early in life. He had not a temper to bear the sort of competition in which we stood, the sort of preference which was often given me. I had not thought Mr. Darcy so bad as this, though I have never liked him. I had not thought so very ill of him. I had supposed him to be despising his fellow creatures in general, but did not suspect him of descending to such malicious revenge, such injustice, such inhumanity as this. After a few minutes' reflection, however, she continued, I do remember his boasting one day at Netherfield of the implacability of his resentments, of his having an unforgiving temper. His disposition must be dreadful. I will not trust myself on the subject, replied Wickham. I can hardly be just to him. Elizabeth was again deep in thought, and after a time exclaimed, 
to treat in such a manner the godson, the friend, the favourite of his father. She could have added, a young man too like you, whose very countenance may vouch for your being amiable. But she contented herself with, and one too, who had probably been his own companion from childhood, connected together, as I think you said, in the closest manner. We were born in the same parish, within the same park. The greatest part of our youth was passed together. Inmates of the same house, sharing the same amusements, objects of the same parental care. My father began life in the profession, which your uncle, Mr. Phillips, appears to do so much credit to, but he gave up everything to be of use to the late Mr. Darcy and devoted all his time to the care of the Pemberley property. He was most highly esteemed by Mr. Darcy, a most intimate, confidential friend. Mr. Darcy often acknowledged himself to be under the greatest obligations to my father's active superintendence, and when, immediately before my father's death, Mr. Darcy gave him a voluntary promise of providing for me, I am convinced that he felt it to be as much a debt of gratitude to him as of affection to myself. How strange, cried Elizabeth, how abominable. I wonder that the very pride of this Mr. Darcy has not made him just to you, if from no better motive that he should not have been too proud to be dishonest, for dishonesty I must call it. It is wonderful, replied Wickham, for almost all his actions may be traced to pride, and pride has often been his best friend. It has connected him nearer with virtue than any other feeling. But we are none of us consistent, and in his behaviour to me there were stronger impulses even than pride. Can such abominable pride as his have ever done him good? Yes, it has often led him to be liberal and generous, to give his money freely to display hospitality, to assist his tenants and relieve the poor, Family pride and filial pride, for he is very proud of what his father was, have done this. Not to appear to disgrace his family, to degenerate from the popular qualities, or lose the influence of the Pemberley house, is a powerful motive. He has also brotherly pride, which, with some brotherly affection, makes him a very kind and careful guardian of his sister, and you will hear him generally cried up as the most attentive and best of brothers. What sort of a girl is Miss Darcy? He shook his head. I wish I could call her amiable. It gives me pain to speak ill of a Darcy, but she is too much like her brother, very, very proud. As a child, she was affectionate and pleasing and extremely fond of me, and I have devoted hours and hours to her amusement. But she is nothing to me now. She is a handsome girl, about fifteen or sixteen, and, I understand, highly accomplished. Since her father's death her home has been London, where a lady lives with her and superintends her education. After many pauses and many trials of other subjects, Elizabeth could not help reverting once more to the first and saying, I am astonished at his intimacy with Mr Bingley. How can Mr Bingley, who seems good humour itself, and is, I really believe, truly amiable, be in friendship with such a man? How can they suit each other? Do you know Mr. Bingley? Not at all. He is a sweet-tempered, amiable, charming man. He cannot know what Mr. Darcy is. Probably not, but Mr. Darcy can please where he chooses. He does not want abilities. He can be a conversable companion if he thinks it worth his while. Among those who are at all his equals in consequence, he is a very different man from what he is to the less prosperous. His pride never deserts him, but with the rich he is liberal-minded, just, sincere, rational, honourable, and perhaps agreeable, allowing something for fortune and figure. The whist party soon afterwards breaking up, the players gathered round the other table, and Mr Collins took his station between his cousin Elizabeth and Mrs Phillips. The usual inquiries as to his success were made by the latter. It had not been very great. He had lost every point, but when Mrs. Phillips began to express her concern thereupon, he assured her, with much earnest gravity, that it was not of the least importance, that he considered the money as a mere trifle, and begged she would not make herself uneasy. I know very well, madam, said he, that when persons sit down to a card table, they must take their chance of these things, and happily I am not in such circumstances as to make five shillings any object. 
There are, undoubtedly, many who could not say the same. But, thanks to Lady Catherine de Boer, I am removed far beyond the necessity of regarding little matters. Mr Wickham's attention was caught, and after observing Mr Collins for a few moments, he asked Elizabeth in a low voice whether her relations were very intimately acquainted with the family of de Boer. Lady Catherine de Boer, she replied, has very lately given him a living. I hardly know how Mr Collins was first introduced to her notice, but he certainly has not known her long. You know, of course, that Lady Catherine de Bourg and Lady Anne Darcy were sisters, consequently that she is aunt to the present Mr Darcy. No, indeed, I did not. I knew nothing at all of Lady Catherine's connections. I never heard of her existence till the day before yesterday. Her daughter, Miss de Bourg, will have a very large fortune, and it is believed that she and her cousin will unite the two estates. This information made Elizabeth smile, as she thought of poor Miss Bingley. Vain indeed must be all her attentions, vain and useless her affection for his sister and her praise of himself, if he were already self-destined to another. Mr Collins, said she, speaks highly both of Lady Catherine and her daughter, but from some particulars that he has related of her ladyship, I suspect his gratitude misleads him, and that... In spite of her being his patroness, she is an arrogant, conceited woman. I believe her to be both in a great degree, replied Wickham. I have not seen her for many years, but I very well remember that I never liked her, and that her manners were dictatorial and insolent. She has the reputation of being remarkably sensible and clever, but I rather believe she derives part of her abilities from her rank and fortune, part from her authoritative manner, and the rest from the pride of her nephew, who chooses that everyone connected with him should have an understanding of the first class. Elizabeth allowed that he had given a very rational account of it, and they continued talking together with mutual satisfaction till supper put an end to cards and gave the rest of the ladies their share of Mr Wickham's attentions. There could be no conversation in the noise of Mrs Phillips's supper party, but his manners recommended him to everybody. Whatever he said was said well, and whatever he did, done gracefully. Elizabeth went away with her head full of him. She could think of nothing but of Mr Wickham, and of what he had told her all the way home. But there was not time for her even to mention his name as they went, for neither Lydia nor Mr Collins were once silent. Lydia talked incessantly of lottery tickets, of the fish she had lost, and the fish she had won. And Mr Collins in describing the civility of Mr. and Mrs. Phillips, protesting that he did not in the least regard his losses at whist, enumerating all the dishes at supper, and repeatedly fearing that he crowded his cousins, had more to say than he could well manage before the carriage stopped at Longbourn House. And so, another chapter closes on the lively adventures of Elizabeth Bennet and the ever-enigmatic Mr. Darcy. The intricacies of love, honour, and society in the Regency era continue to captivate us. Will misunderstandings be untangled? Will true feelings be revealed? The story of pride and prejudice is far from over, and we're excited to journey through it with you. If you found yourself lost in the world of Jane Austen, do us a favour, click that like button, and if you haven't already, subscribe to Obsidian River Productions. We're dedicated to crafting immersive narrations of timeless classics, and we'd be honoured to have you as part of our growing community. For those yearning for more, don't forget to explore our catalogue of full-length ad-free narrations at obsidianriver.com shop dot until our next rendezvous in Austin's enchanting universe. Fare thee well.